And then tonight, you lackey people, and the only people talking are the speakers. <laughs> They're okay. We've got Judy Wood and Andrew Johnson, doctors, loads of degrees. <coughs> they will present empirical evidence and peer-reviewed, and Judy has been at the federal courts in America giving evidence on 9-11 and the towers, which, if there's any about the English courts, is a paper thing. <laughs> Do talk about things, don't forget about it. But I'm delighted to have them. Um, she's come over from America. Andrew's done some brilliant talks on chemtrails, but this as a pairing since Kenny and Dolly. <laughs> so they are our islands in the street tonight. Let's give them some respect, turn off your phones, and honour the old don't ask a question because they will give you the answer if you don't ask it. So thank you very much. This is uh, Dame Judy Wood. And first, Andrew is going to say something. Yeah, thank you very much. Yes, yeah, before Judy starts, what we're basically going to do is Judy's going to do the first hour. Uh, I'm going to do the second. Uh, basically, you're going to see Judy's, you know, there's quite a few people who know what Judy's research represents and everything, so I'm not going to uh, dwell on that. But uh, I'm, she's going to tell you about how the towers were destroyed. Um, she's reverse engineered how the towers were destroyed. My presentation is about is reverse engineering and cover up and why you haven't heard about it. So hopefully you'll go away from tonight with a completely new understanding of 9-11. Um, this is the first time we've done an event together. So, you know, it just happened, somebody in Italy invited us to do a talk, so we are going there at the weekend, and it worked out cheaper for Dr Judy to come through the UK rather than fly direct to Italy. So when, when we'd established that, we thought, well, let's try and do a couple of dates in the UK. Um, we financed this ourselves, essentially. You know, no, nobody's paid us to do any of this. Um, I was due to come here on the 18th, as you probably know anyway, and then I just sort of said to Dr Judy, would you like to come and do learning? And said, yeah, no problem, because we'd raid this thing in Italy. So that's how it's come about. Uh, there's no sort of double dealing or anything like that. Um, Judy's financed everything herself, just about. Um, we've had a little bit of help, but basically this is totally self-financed. Um, so if you're wondering about that, that's how it's been done, uh, just through sort of perseverance and determination, really. Um, and uh, we're gonna do, for anybody that knows people around the country, we're doing Derby tomorrow, which I've set up, I, I booked that. Uh, so if there's anybody that lives near Derby or Leicester, anywhere like that, and they couldn't get here tonight, that's an open event, just come along, uh, it's free to get in, we're asking for donations. We've now arranged Isle of Wight on the 28th, which is a Friday, and we've arranged Brighton on the 29th, uh, which will be in the centre of Brighton. So again, if you know any of those people in those areas, uh, please uh, you know, send out send them the word. You know, particularly uh, when you've seen tonight's presentation. Those two presentations, well, those three presentations will be Dr. Judy, not really me. Uh, I'll, I'll speak a bit at Derby, but I'm not going to talk specifically. Um, I've got DVDs and stuff there, uh, which you can get in the interval. So uh, uh, we've got uh, both the books that we brought now, we've immediately been sold. Uh, I've got my book here and stuff, but uh, that's basically enough from me, and I'm now going to pass you over to capable hands of Dr. Judy.
answer. Who did it and then how to do it? All sorts of theories start popping up about who did it, how they did it, and you know, taking guesses like uh, somebody has a deck of flashcards and keeps picking one out from the other. That's not how you go about finding out what happened. <clears throat> like you find a dead body. And then you find a smoking gun. Ah, that must have been what killed the body. But then wait a minute, the dead body is in the garage door. So uh, does that mean the garage door killed him, not the gun? Because then you find about the poison. What things do you put together? I think in our culture, we're so geared to jumping to the answer, we forget to look at the connection between things. We see two things, we connect them. See three things, you gotta figure out what order to put them in. How do you know what <coughs> things to look at? So the first thing you do in solving a crime is to determine what happened. And only then do you determine how it happened. And only then can you determine who was involved in making it happen. <coughs> and why they did it. But what we're gonna focus on tonight is what happened. And I don't know if the news here is like it was in the U.S., where on the TV uh, there was kind of nonstop coverage of this Casey Anthony trial, gearing everyone up to who's guilty. They forgot to cover this aspect, what happened. And the reason why they came back with a not guilty verdict, we don't know how the child died. That wasn't shown what happened. So how can you, you hang anybody for it? <coughs> Well, it turns out these towers didn't burn up, they didn't slam the ground, they turned into dust and midair. That we know. We see it, we're told it was a collapse, but then you look at the picture. Does that look like a collapse to you? If they slammed to the ground, there would be over a million tons of debris piled on the ground. But that didn't happen. Then that would have been flooded if they'd slammed to the ground. That didn't happen. And the seismic recordings would have reflected two 500,000 ton buildings slamming to the ground and another 230,000 ton building slamming to the ground. Didn't happen. <coughs> These things we can establish. But we need to first look at what happened. All right, it's lack of debris. Bathtub wasn't damaged. These are the, the most important issues. Relax size and according. This, there's a bunch of other things like uh, dustification, you know, lather. All of these other issues we'll, we can also address. These all confirm that, but these three main things at the top, those prove the case. <coughs> well, right after the towers went away, here's what was left. It's, it's quite amazing that everything with the WTC prefix went away, but not much of anything else did. It didn't even spill across the street. This 41-story uh, building here, Bankers Trust, the two towers made up seven times the volume. So picture seven of these things. That wasn't missing. It's just not there. <coughs> From ground level, we're looking at where Tower 1 used to be. There's a little bit of the stairwell left where people survived. North wall, south wall. The ambulance was parked at ground level. Now, if the, you have all the steel falling down, <coughs> some of it going to end up in your field of view. There's a few pieces of aluminum cladding. The, the, the structures were steel columns with aluminum cladding around the outside. All you see here is aluminum cladding. And interestingly, none of it seems to have hit the, uh, the ambulance. The north and south. Let's get in over there. <clears throat> Here's a, a group of clips right here. Peter Jennings, the next day, about noon on the 12th. So we go back to then, before people were told it was a pile and, and it was this uh, huge amount of debris and 
all this collapsing and pancaking, before all of the stories were introduced into our minds, what was, was the initial observation that was made? Stephanopoulos is uh, down in Lower Manhattan today, George. Uh, I don't know if you've heard a little earlier uh, me raise this question, which was asked, actually raised by ABC's Jackie Jive as we look at these areas down below and the video of where the towers used to stand and where is all the rubble gone. And have you, have you been able to end? Is there any way you can answer that question? I'm sorry, Peter, I didn't get the question. Okay, I apologize. Jackie Judd and several other people keep asking us, when you look at where the towers used to stand, there is surprisingly so little rubble. Where did all the rubble well, go? It's a very good question, Peter, and I have asked some people who've been doing some of the rescue and recovery work this morning. If you look behind me, you can see the very remains, the skeletal remains of the World Trade Center. And one volunteer, Robert Gerlinski, explained to me the reason there's so little rubble is that all of it simply fell down into the ground <laughs> and was pulverized, evaporated. Evaporated. Okay. Evaporated. Now, what you have here, I, I, I kind of feel badly for the people. I don't mean to be making fun of them. They're doing the best they can. They're trying to make sense of a situation that doesn't make sense. And it, you know, where did the, the towers go? Well, I must have just fall down to the ground and evaporate. But, well, if you were there that day, what would you come up with? And, and we as, as humans tend to keep asking questions until we're given answers. It doesn't make, matter if the answer makes sense. We just pick it up the answer. <clears throat> and, uh, yep. I was astonished at the degree to which solid materials were turned into pulverized dust as a consequence of that building collapse. I think it was striking. That's a doctor who was also concerned with what people were breathing in. And he noticed, he's not an engineer, but even he noticed it all turned to dust. What, you know, why are people talking about that? Here's what's left. Building one, two, three, four, five, six. And you start to notice these cylindrical cutouts down to ground level. And then seven. Anything with a WTC prefix it was destroyed that day. But little of anything else. One of my biggest fascinations is building four. Building four has this north wing remaining. You can see not all the way back to where this the north wing begins but at this distance in. And it was like it was sliced off with an exacto knife. A surgical cut. Here's another view of it, right where it was cut off. You know, if you're, if you're looking across the street, here's what you'd see. If you had binoculars, you could look and see it was on somebody's desk. <coughs> it was just sliced. And at that point, when I saw that picture, it reminded me of something I saw as a child our family drove to Topeka, Kansas the morning after this horrendous tornado had destroyed much of the city. There was a, an apartment building, maybe it was a dorm, but you know, for a child, it was an apartment building. And there was a bed, the apartment was sliced in two, it was a bed that was still made. Not, nothing messed up, had some magazines on the bedspread, some books on the, on the dresser, <coughs> clothes hanging in the closet. I don't think people walked out on that unsupported floor and made that bed. This is impressive. And it looked just like this image. It was interesting what the survivors said who were, there's this arrow going down here. I think this goes here. Survive, people survived out of each of these two places. The bottom of, of uh, building three and the bottom of building one, that little pimple. And Jay Jonas, one of those survivors, said this. The look guy said, he said, guys, there used to be 106 floors above us. Now I'm seeing sunshine. There's nothing above us. That big building doesn't exist. These are the biggest buildings, office buildings in the world. And I didn't see one desk, one chair, one phone, nothing. 
Another one described walking out onto an empty football field. By God, that's what it looks like. He came out of this place. Yeah, you, first of all, when the, before the dust cleared, you'd think you're a god. And by the time they, they cleared away the 106 stories, you know, you'd be dead, wouldn't you? But then when the wind blew the uh, dust away, they could look up and see blue sky. Again, look at this building four. It's just missing, like somebody swept it up, the little bit left. And there's the, these cylindrical cutouts were also a big fascination. <coughs> That's what went missing in building four. And a closer look. There it is. There's a few, I call these wheat checks, the, the prefab units of outer building in Tower One. And this little tiny corner of building four, but the rest is gone. And that's what we saw looking in there. <clears throat> and right at that point where that arrow is, I found a picture, the very first level below the below ground level. It was in the mall. And also a picture just below that. And then I have a picture where we're going to be looking down that direction <coughs> the basement below that. And this area of the uh, basement, the parking garage, is painted green so that you know you're underneath Tower 4. And it's purple under Building 5. So for the loading docks, when they bring the deliveries in, they'll know where to park. Come down to the parking garage. We're in quite deep. These are the first pictures of search crews underneath the World Trade Center, desperately looking for survivors. <laughs> Isn't that echo? It wasn't necessarily this place. It was one of the places down below the ground. But here they are in the, uh, the loading docks. Purple's under Building 5. Green's under Building 4. And that green hallway down there is underneath that part that's missing. This is picture was taken after 9-11. You get some dust in there, more dirt than usual, but that's about it. Lights still work. So where did the towers go? This is looking from the other part of the complex, just above um, where the mall was, looking westward. You had holes in the ground. There's Stairwell B, where those 14 people survived, and the corner facade of Tower 1. Where did the rest of the debris go? Did they have a big pile of... Anyone here have um, pickup sticks as a child? They, they come in a nice, neat package, but once you dump them, it's a nice, pretty big pile of haphazard stuff. It, you know, it doesn't stack neatly, but where is anything? There should be at least a million tons of debris there, piled up in the ground. And by calling it a pile, they have workers on the pile, we're led to believe that there's a pile there. They keep referring to it as a pile. What pile? It didn't happen. Mind you, if you uh, you know blow up the building with bombs, melt the building, burn it up with fire, whatever you use to destroy it, it's going down in the ground. The only way it doesn't go down the ground is if it turns into dust in midair. <clears throat> Here's from the other side. We're looking this way, towards this way. This is the opposite side of that building. Not hiding on this side either. So, this is uh, what one of those survivors also had said. They were inside that stairwell to kept telling them, you know, we're in stairwell B, tower one. Where are you? Tower one, stairwell B. Uh, and then they, finally, the, the guy on the outside, this, they're calling their walkie-talkies out to be rescued. Where's tower one? They, they thought the voice was coming from beyond. So that was in this stairwell. So this is what the scene looked like. And uh, they, if you heard, if you were a first responder, you heard a rescue call from from tower one, stairwell B. Uh, yeah, where is Tower 
is Tower One, Stairwell B. This is an eight story building, building six. So we can see that there's about eight stories left of the north wall of Tower One. Um, where are the other uh, 102 stories? Of the outer wall, much less the innards of the building. And where's the middle of building six? Gone. And uh, building seven, it didn't even spill across the street. You still see the sidewalk over there next to the postal building. Yeah. And I've been up there recently too, and it's still uh, pristine on the side of the post office. It should have looked like it was um, machine gun fired if you had stuff blasting out from the pancaking building. It didn't happen. Another view of that, and here's the bathtub wall. Learn about what that bathtub is. But you can see it's right down to ground level. <laughs> so the, the towers were actually built in the Hudson River. This was the old shoreline, and they brought in land and filled it in. And they had this bathtub, kind of like the opposite of uh, you know, the, the dike system, or kind of like that. <laughs> so they extended out the land from, from there. <clears throat> so if you broke that bathtub wall, Manhattan would have been flooded. And that didn't happen. Here's another view of where the old shoreline used to be. And they built this, the tower there with this uh, bedrock about 70 feet below the water table. And the old path train terminal used to be here, and they moved it into the bathtub. So it came around there and back out. <coughs> path train tunnel wasn't destroyed. You would think if something was banging down on the, the basement there, you, the tunnel that goes underneath the Hudson would have been <coughs> disrupted, didn't leak. Once they pumped out the water from all the fire hoses, the tunnel stayed dry. It was fine. There's the bathroom <coughs> after 9 11, after it's been cleaned out. Footprint of Tower 1, Tower 2. And this is uh, footprint of Tower 1, it's right about here. And that wall, first, the, before they in, filled it in and put the WFC buildings over here, that used to be the end of it with the road on top of it. If you had a 110-story building crashing down, surely it would have damaged that wall. It wasn't significantly damaged. <coughs> now, <coughs> if you, uh, it's a nice color. Um, if you're gonna drop the building, Drop a bowling ball off the roof. There, this is time. This is height. So the bowling ball or bowling ball is going to end up 9.22 seconds for it to hit the ground. But if it's going to trigger the next floor, if you say it's a progressive collapse, let's say nine out of every ten floors is missing and damaged and missing. So each floor is going to fall that ten stories, go splat, turn into dust. But let, let's pretend there's enough energy left to, to keep that going. There's the 9.22 seconds. Well, it turns out in order to, you know, to get the next one going, this one can't start for uh, two and a half seconds because it has to wait to be triggered by the up above floor. So how can the lower floor start moving before the upper floor has triggered it? So it takes this, this lag time and it'll be at least 31 seconds. But guess what? The North Tower, eight seconds from that blue line to that red line. The ground shook for eight seconds. How can that be? If you have a jerky with a boom, 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 boom down the building, uh, and it takes at least nine and a half seconds for the, the roof to hit the ground without any resistance in between, without any air resistance even. So something's not right there. So the seismic signal would have reflected those, the half ton, the half a million ton building flaming the ground, and that didn't happen. Those buildings didn't hit the ground. Michael Ober, this uh, EMT, made the 
was neat comment. I don't remember the sound of a building hitting the ground. Someone told me it was measuring Richter scale, but I don't know how true that is because how could I not remember hearing it? Um, because uh, that part of the building doesn't make a thud when it hits. Where did the building go? There it is. Now, the same bedrock that that building sat on, further up in midtown Manhattan, there was an earthquake in January that year. Look how long the ground shook there for. And notice uh, in particular, like all <coughs> earthquakes, see this, I call it the nozzle moving up to the big signal. It's when the P wave, the primary wave, first hits the seismographic recording station, then the S wave follows, the secondary wave. That's how it works. You get one and then the other. But uh, with 9 11, there wasn't any incident. So there's, there's where the P wave arrives and where the S wave arrives. <coughs> and this was slightly closer to the recording station, the Palisades, than the towers. So here's, uh, whoops, <laughs> here it was here. So there's no, no little nozzle thing leading up to it where the P wave arrives first and the S wave. So it turns out these don't have P waves and S waves, only surface waves. The signal did not travel through the ground. Another uh, sign that it didn't slam the ground. Look at the overall chart. This this picks up right about when Tower 2 went away, and then Tower 1 goes away. You have all these uh, quarry blasts all afternoon. You pick those up just fine. Come down to Building 7, and you see that red line? That red line shows what Building 7 went away, but you see uh, the Fox Islands earthquake right after that, but you don't see anything standing out of background noise from Building 7. This Tower 1 measured a 2.3 on the Richter scale. This measured a 0.6. That's less than the quarry blast. In New Jersey and Pennsylvania. Uh, let's compare it with the Seattle Kingdom. That's a controlled demolition. You have, notice the dust doesn't really rise above the highest point of that building. And you're left with stuff at the end of the, the day. And look at the seismic chart here. It has that the little nozzle thing leading up to the <coughs> P wave arise before the S wave. Oh, mm, it's different here. And look how long <coughs> the event lasted. Now, also look at the free fall time for the Seattle Kingdom would have been four seconds, approximately. A little under four seconds. Less than the time the, signal, the main signal lasted. But we had a signal for the North Tower of, of uh, was it eight seconds? That was less than. And that doesn't make sense. This makes more sense. This is for Building 7. Five different recording stations. Can you pick out uh, the signal of background noise? I have 6.4 shown on there because that's the, it would be the free fall time of a billiard ball falling off the roof, just to give you a, a comparison to the <laughs> other ones. This one, they, they couldn't even guess what was the, what the, in here the signal was. They could not pick it out of background noise at that station. And these other ones, I think they had to use some creativity in picking it out, where they thought that the uh, surface wave arrived. These are calculations for what the S and P wave should have been there, but they couldn't pick it out on the chart. And this building was six times the potential energy of the Seattle Kingdom. It should have been at least a 2.3 on the register scale, because that's what the Seattle Kingdom was. It would have been more. So if we compare the relative seismic signals of the different buildings, Tower 1 acted like it was just a 20-story building that hit the ground. 
by the seismic signal. And uh, Tower 2 was about the size of a, the signal was about the size of 16 floors. And Building 7 was like two and a half stories compared to the kingdom. So the building turned to dust. A new phenomenon, we've never seen that before. A new phenomenon needs a new word to describe it. Let us call it dustification. The building turned into dust. There it is. Steel coming down, wood to trailing. Kind of looks like Alka Seltzer tablets. Yeah, if you think about Alka Seltzer tablet, I think oh, we have those here, you know what I'm talking about? Yeah. Okay. They look fine. They look like this tablet, big enough package, looks, you know, it's like solid material until you change its environment. When you drop it in the water, it changes environment, its behavior changes, it frosts up and dissolves. Well, when you change the environment of this material here, it frosts up and dissolves. Something in the environment had to have changed to cause this to do that. But this steel, would you believe, was not found in the ground below. It dissolved before it got there. And uh, what you did. Yeah. This is a regular speed. You can follow this down. See these chunks falling down to that intersection. Go look at that intersection <coughs> right after this and try to find the steel that's falling there. And then we have the slow motion video. I think I might have to click on that one. Let's go. Oh, okay. <laughs> so <it's like laughs> to, to watch it slowly dissolve. Yeah, it leaves this, uh, <coughs> these erated columns there. But uh, this. If you look down this edge, see this is the Verizon building over here. You just see it, the top that showed up there, but look at this chunk. It's falling down the intersection right below. But if, if nothing else, you can realize that it's trailing something. How could it be trailing something? Is that, you know, a, a dirty window so that someone forgot to clean for all these years? But what is that material <coughs> coming off of it? if it's not the steel dissolving. And it's a tremendous amount of uh, dust coming off of it. Here's that intersection, here's the Verizon building. This is where that stuff was headed. These guys are, of course, in their hiding places that have just come out of their hiding places. And you can read kind of their uh, reaction. Hands at the side, hands on the hip, folded arms, like, what the heck just happened? They, they don't know what happened. It doesn't make sense. Just paper and dust. Probably there's a few pieces of aluminum cladding around, but there's, I don't see any steel here. I know there's some steel that was down here further, but not the kind of steel you'd expect to see piling up there. Here's the first bit of, of uh, blue sky you can start to see. Then we had diagonally behind us, if we looked behind us from where that they were standing, that picture was taken from right down there. When Tower One went away, this car lot uh, went into spontaneous combustion, appeared to at least. And that's quite a distance away <coughs> from the towers. And it's just a sea of paper, unburned paper in between. If it was fire that caught these uh, fiery debris, why, why didn't the paper get burned in between? <coughs> Another really interesting uh, thing about the North Tower is when it comes down, it leaves this spire, as people would refer to it as, it's some core, remaining core columns that stand there for a little bit and then they fade and turn into dust. <coughs> they start to drop a little bit, but they don't, uh, I mean, how's the thing going to drop, drop vertically down? Do you have a 700 foot hole? the ground it drops into. They didn't tip over, they would have taken out several blocks of the buildings and you would see a big long thing like down. <coughs> more than that, it, you'll see more about this, is, uh, oops, is it uh, working? I feel like you notice, uh, you know, this, this just comes out and exposes these columns. You can see blue sky behind this. So uh, this dust coming off of that column. I'm just going to freeze it now. Okay. It, it, the 
was just coming off that call, and it wasn't just that they settled on it, because immediately the, uh, the, the <coughs> stuff peels away and leaves those columns remaining. You see crisp edges of the columns, and then they're no longer crisp. So the, if it was dust settling on it, it would look kind of furry all over there, and gradually it would stick to it. Why is the dust going to settle on a vertical column? And settle it on a vertical column in two seconds? And how does something fall straight down? As it starts to come straight down, it starts dropping because something is getting removed <coughs> below it. If it's failing below from what? What's the weight on the columns? You've taken the load off of the columns. They're standing there without a weight on them. Why are they going to gonna collapse below? I should be right now. Okay. Good Lord. There are no words. The crisp edges. That's you can see large pieces of the building falling. You can see the smoke rising. You can see a portion of the, the, the side. Good Lord. There are no words. You can see large pieces of the building falling. You can see the smoke rising. <laughs> You can see a portion of the, the, the side of the building now just being covered on the right side as I look at it, covered in smoke. Kind of went came down a bit and then turned to dust and drift. Yeah. Down a bit and then dust right. and drift. Yeah. Right, because where else did that dust come from? It, it couldn't have uh, landed on it. You see, this is crisp background and then it becomes furry down here. Same with here. This is right after it's peeled away. I call it the peeling banana appearance. It leaves this exposed, crisp edges, and then they're no longer crisp. It's almost like the rest has been kind of lazy, but it was like misaligned just a little bit. And oh, then you just missed an edge, and there's a little spike left. I, I have a good uh, feeling <laughs> that this is the top of Stairwell B. And those guys who survived in Stairwell B was at the base of all of this. And it, it, they were expecting something to come thud down on top of them. Never happened. And a view from across the river. Here, here, here and see, you see it's sort of straight furry. If it was dust that landed on it, it wouldn't look clear in the background here. And notice the time between these two pictures. See the dust fall, flowing around this WFC3 it is. And it's a little bit further. It's, it's very, very short. Uh, duration. But here you can see that there's dust flowing off of this thing down at that level. I call this lather. It's a particular phenomenon. When I came to uh, a new phenomenon, without having to describe, you know, oh, characteristic 234975-A, that's hard to remember. Lather is a lot easier to remember. And so coming up with, uh, you know, holding pattern, a, a terminology just would represent a particular phenomenon until I could figure out what it was. If you name it by something before you know what it is, you're biasing your observation. If you call it smoke, you're going to assume it's fire is the cause. That's, that's how we work. So if I give it a different name, lather, we're not going to confuse it. That's not going to mislead us because that lather is something you do in the shower. It's not something that happens to steel. Here's Tower 1, right after Tower 2's demise. It lathered up, ground to roof. And then uh, this is uh, one of the towers, I think this is Building 1, the part here. But again, there's a tremendous amount of dust pouring out of this field on the way down. Now these are aluminum cladding here, and it didn't seem to be as effective on the outside of the building. But the steel, Checks, I call them, the prefab units of three columns wide by three floors tall. And this would be pretty interesting. This this is uh, the north face of Building 7. Oops, did I hit it? Go low to the corner. Here, busted open windows, and but from the roof to uh, 
uh, ground, one face and one face only, uniform pouring out. If it's if it's from fires inside and smoke needs to get out, you get a traffic jam. You think something would come out the, the north face, out those open windows. But it's coming uniformly out the whole face, which is really peculiar. Um, see if we can it's not like it's pushing out, it's like it's being pulled out. If you, you know, carefully observe it, and that's why it might not be coming out of the North Face. The North. But this happened all afternoon. That's a lot of material. Could that be where the majority of Building 7 went? So looking at how the dust rolled out, that's another uh, characteristic. This wall of dust when Tower 2 went away, it was chasing people down the street, remember. Didn't burn them up, just left them covered with dust. They might have had trouble breathing, but it didn't burn them up. If that dust had been hot, these would have been cooked. And then we have Bob and Bree, who had a video camera right <laughs> wonderful <coughs> from this window. And I don't have a video clip from here, I just have a couple of frames from it. But the dust rolled out a certain distance and then went up. An exact distance, as you can see, it comes right out to this boundary and it just starts going up. Now, if you uh, empty your vacuum cleaner and dribble that dust on the floor, an excellent spill bunch. It's only going to go so far. It's going to taper out, too. So this is uh, roughly stuff. Here's a couple of frames from, from the Bob and Bree video. And it doesn't quite touch their window, and then it rises up. It's like yeast bread rising up. What would cause it to do that? Well, if you throw rocks, they're going to go a certain distance. They can go a lot further than they go when you throw a handful of flour or dust. Now, if those rocks become dust in midair, they're going to, if they break down <coughs> at the same rate, they're going to come to a certain place where they quit moving forward. But why are they going up? And this stuff keeps going up. This is a month later. This is actually more than a month later. This is Halloween, October 31st, 2001. And they're wetting it down. You see the, uh, the misting here. This isn't a hot pile because you have hydraulics that are working over that. Wet tire tracks, but you have, the, it looks like almost like mold coming up out of the ground. It's like the fumes are coming up around that. Dust doesn't do that. And it went up. From the Seattle King Dome, many other buildings with controlled demolitions, the stuff doesn't go up further, much further than the roof. Why was this going up? And it looks like it's on a mission. You know, almost like a funnel cloud. It goes up and then until it gets up to a certain level of atmosphere where it starts dissipating. It also kind of interesting that it, the darker stuff down below moves westward and the other stuff goes up and southward. I think it's two different processes. Then we have, uh, maybe I can show you where that is. It's over on this, on the East River, right about there, where that truck is. The famous Toasted Cars. Look at this window trim. It looks like it's made out of jelly. Saggy door. Nice tire. Blue inflated. Uh, no trace of the tire here. I've got a closer up picture of that. You can see the, the steel from the steel belts of tires. Very abrupt boundary here. Take a closer look. That's the right side of the car. And the left side of the car is kind of issue, but first let's take a, look, a closer look at this. Look at those lights. Plastic lights on the roof that were melted. You have some horrendous fire going on in here. Why are the lights melted? The, uh, the inside is just totally toast, even in the back. But this uh, picture on the left side, look at that round spot. Is fire burn like that? Fire is you know, not just black and white, but shades of gray in between. You have you know, partially tapers off. It doesn't leave a masked spot there. That's something you do with you know, like optical interference. Or darker, what you do, you know, blocking out 
something. And that's, that would give you an aha moment of some type of interference that might cause that. It's just circular patterns, like on the double exposure. And the truck lid's open. I started noticing this pattern of the truck lid being popped open, door latches missing, almost like whatever was getting to these things, like the door latches and trunk latches first. There was a first responder who, during the destruction of one of the towers, tried to get inside building seven, this side door. And this is building five and building six. And he put down the basement, and uh, it looked like uh, that wasn't a good place to be. And he wasn't going to stay there. It didn't look safe. It's supposed to be a bomb shelter, but it didn't look safe. So he came out, and it was filled with blackness. And he was trying to make his way up the street. And he said, thank goodness these cars went in spontaneous combustion, because then I could see where I was going. And uh, this is where he was walking up in here. Here's where those toasty cars were found over on this side. Some folks say they were, they were towed there, but I know at least some were not. They were <coughs> spontaneous combustion there. There were first responders who were trying to, again, like um, George Stephanopoulos, were trying to figure out why these cars were in spontaneous combustion. They figured there must have been a fireball that rolled down from the World Trade Center and hit these cars to make them go off like that. And also, there was a first responder over here on the ambulance driving across the bridge. She said you could feel the heat from the bridge. Um, but the paper didn't burn, all this distance in between. Something she was sensing as heat must have been reaching in there. So on this map, I have yellow. Uh, all of the roads where there have been toasted cars or bodies and interesting things happening. Uh, and it doesn't seem to go much wider than that. It was a toasted car lot. It seems to have gone, including down by the, the tunnel. Some strange things down there. Here's where that guy was walking out the grid back up there. Uh, here's West Broadway. I call it the swamp. It kind of looked like that. <coughs> you really saw that fire truck where that fellow came out. Uh, it's every single car along that path was, was uh, toasted. I use the word toasted as in it's toast, it's history. You can't fix it, you have to get another one. Not necessarily as to causation, but just that it's something happened to it. How else do you describe what happened to it? Without, you know, burnt, I won't use because that implies fire with heat. So that uh, fellow came out of the building seven, walked up here to this intersection, C, and then turned over that direction. But this was, all cars were toasted up to here. Um, what kind of a fire? Flying debris? Well, if so, we should see something on the roofs on either side of this canyon. We see dust. So what toasts all these cars down here? Here's a bus midway down. There's building seven. Still looking healthy. Um, I don't see burnt marks on that bus either, which is another strange thing. And something happened to it. This thing's already rusted over here. Oxygen hose draped across the pile. Would you do that if it was hot? 
And would you beat the other end using it for a petty torch? <laughs> seen this picture. So, oh, this is evidence is hot. It's just the one picture. Well, at point E here is right out in front of where the WTC3 has been. And that afternoon, 9-11, it was a water main break. And they made this little lake. And here's a guy waiting in knee deep water right out in front of uh, building three. You can see that's the same uh, point here. So we know this isn't because it's hot. There's something else going on here. <coughs> Also, looking up West, uh, West Broadway, that's what I call the swamp, look at all the unburned paper, toasted cars, but look at the bushy trees, over leaf. <laughs> Guys, this is engine. You know, what would happen the back end of this one's down? But the engine's gone. Why, why the engine? <laughs> belts around them, and they, they're curled around the vertical axis, not buckled over. And this looks more like a, a lasagna noodle. <laughs> Column's still straight. And we can't hold it. Where, where do those come from? Come straight up. Uh, various places in the, in the building. I don't have that information. Really, but yeah, from, from the towers. Yeah, these are from the WTC. Here's an I-beam. I-beams don't curl around the vertical axis. From too much load, they should go the other way. And here we see straight chunks coming off the building. And if you notice here, there's, there's uh, material in here that is no longer here. What caused it to come apart? Uh, you know, midair, on the way down. You see this is close to the ground because there's the building. Also, if you notice, uh, this is building three. All the roof line down. Down here, it looks warped. As it turned out, this vertical chunk, remember that was left with that bite out of it? This is the bite about to happen. And this one that was found in Baker's Trust. Baker's Trust had no fires. 
why is it fed like this? Can you see through holes? Um, you know, loading might do this, might do this. How do you get that? What does this have in common with something else? Let's curl of the beam. Who's molybdenum? This was done not, this is the World Trade Center. This was something else that somebody could reproduce in their own lab all of the same phenomenon, including upside down cars. This is a car to park in front. You know, it, it should have tires down toward the pavement, not up toward the sky. This one's toasted. This one's upside down. It's like they either get toasted or they're flipped. Usually not both. All the marble facade missing. Double pane windows. Outer pane missing and pane still intact. Weather. What kind of weather was, did we have that day? Well, um, according to, uh, you know, CBS is this? Yeah, they, they, as nice as can be, weather in New York. You know, people ask me why I have been so attracted over the years to hurricane coverage, but it, it, there's risk involved, there is, uh, you know, the peril of not knowing what's going to happen, that adventure, and it's pitting yourself against the, an enemy. It's like war, only no one is shooting at you specifically. Uh, yeah, that's what the allure, but there is an area storm that I am not, that I, the juices don't flow, and you look yeah. and check it out. Yeah, remember that when Oh, I'm showing the video clip of Maybe a star on YouTube, but uh, you know, uh, you gotta get up close and personal. And the, this is Hurricane Ike. This, uh, that was, uh, that was uh, wasn't this uh, Rita? You would know. You know what I think it was Rita. Yeah. Rita in Galveston, Texas. Yeah, yeah. Galveston. And, uh, uh, you know, obviously Katrina before that changed so many of our histories. It was so, so traumatic. You know, and it's one funny thing I think of. I think of if only a hurricane had come on 9 11. Remember, they didn't knew how, they didn't know how to use instruments. The terrorists they they took off in Boston, right. and they literally after they took over the aircraft, they steered by line of sight. And it was that crystal clear September day. Sure was, yeah. And if it were only uh, one of these weather days, history would have been rewritten. And I think about that a lot now, and especially this time of year. So, are you still with the peak of hurricanes? Yeah, you're still like forty years. Forty years. Imagine that. Forty years of storm chasing too. This was it taped just a little over a year ago. He still didn't know that what was happening right now. This was on 9-11. There's New York City. How many of you knew that there was a hurricane? How many of you on 9-11 knew there was a hurricane? But for four days, it was aimed straight to New York City.
pressure system. That high pressure system met up with Hurricane Aaron over Manhattan on 9-11 at 10 a.m. Also, this interesting magnetic field. <laughs> the first look at uh, <coughs> this is the relative humidity. These vertical lines are when the various events happen at 9-11. The uh, Tower 1 getting its whole Tower 2, the tower, tower 2 going into dust, Tower 1 going into dust, and then Building 7. What is so striking is 20 minutes before the North Tower got its hole, the Earth's magnetic field starts drifting down. And then right when it gets its hole, it starts drifting back up. It goes horizontally, and then it starts down with uh, Tower 2's dustification, and then it really drops with Tower 1's dustification. Then it's haywire all afternoon until Building 7 turns to dust, or final demise. And that's pretty much back to normal after that. Just coincidence. Now, here's the... Uh, High pressure system moving in from the west. So high pressure is coming to Manhattan. This is from JFK Airport data. But the hurricane was moving in from the east, and apparently they met right there. It was the maximum effect of both. All right, some more proof of concept. We see this. Uh, yeah, that's some, some interesting. Oh, this is part. Of, oh, this is the. Um, this thing turning, fuming up here? Can you talk out a bit? Could you turn around? Alright. Oh. It's mumbling and I can't hear what okay. it's talking about. So. Um, in, this, uh, in this video clip, this is from 9-11, this door handle had fumes coming out of it. Remember how door handles went away before the rest of the car did? Oh. And this is in somebody's lab where they got fumes coming out of the, and this, this is an iron block two inches by two inches by seven inches tall. And it bends over, crumples up, and starts fuming. <coughs> yeah, it just it, it wads up. Where does that material go? How do you get solid iron to do that? It kind of makes you wonder about the uh, fuming elsewhere. Remember the toasted cars? They got toasted right after the tower went poof. Not during. And here's uh, John Hutchison's experiment with his boat. After the, the power gets turned off, then the boat goes into spontaneous combustion. You can tell when the thing is, is running because you get the kind of water droplets jumping up. This is a steel bar turning into jelly, just waddling around the table. This is evidence to the entire planet that free energy technology already exists. As long as everyone knows, everyone is safe in developing it. Don't need to hide in the darkness of your basement to develop free energy technology if everybody knows it exists. It's not a secret anymore. That's the most significant thing I think about 9-11. Yeah, it's good to find out who did it, but that's not going to keep from happening again. That technology is out there. Now we need to decide what we are going to do about it. We as a society need to choose what to do with it. It's out there. It's been out there for probably 100 years or more. Oh, thank you. Uh, right. Stuff like this. Um, Dr. Judy presented in the first half. Essentially, she showed you the evidence of how the towers were destroyed. A lot of questions, you know, people are not familiar with what's been presented. I've got DVDs out there explaining more about the Hutchison effect uh, and the stuff on the table there, so go and get those. If you can't go, don't get time to get them or there isn't enough, grab a leaflet, you can get them off the website, send them out through the post. Our aim is to give you access to this information. It's not to make money. 
This has cost us money. It's cost us a lot of money. But we, we think it's so important that you know, this is what I spend a proportion of my money on. Unfortunately, I'm still in the employment and stuff like that, so I can fund this, right? But, um, so there's lot, all the information you need, right? The message from tonight, all the information you need to make a decision on this as to whether, they're telling the, whether we're telling the truth or whether we're lying is available. All available for you. All you've got to do now is work through it at your own pace. <coughs> Email me. Ask me questions. If you think there's something wrong, if you think I'm not telling the truth, ask me questions. There won't be a lot of time tonight, so you're going to have to take a bloody leaflet, <coughs> go onto my website, click on the contact button and ask me a bloody question. Alright? So that's, that's what I've just been saying. Dr. G's book, getting more in November hopefully. All being well, so if you do want that, have your available. Okay, starting with Eisenhower, if this works. In the council of government, we must guard against the acquisition of unwanted influence, whether sought or unsought, by the military industrial complex. The potential for the disastrous rise of misplaced power exists and will persist. We must never let the weight of this combination endanger our liberties or democratic processes. We should take nothing for granted. Only an alert and knowledgeable citizen can compare the proper meshing of the huge industrial and military machinery of defense with our peaceful methods and goals. So let security and liberty, today the solitary inventor, tinkering in his shop, has been overshadowed by testing in laboratories and testing fields. In the same fashion, the free university, university, historically the fountainhead of free ideas and scientific discovery, has experienced a revolution in the conduct of research. Partly because of the huge cost involved, a government contract becomes virtually a substitute for intellectual curiosity. For every old blackboard, there are now hundreds of new electronic computers. The prospect of domination of the nation's scholars by federal employment, project allocations, and the power of money is ever present and is gravely to be regarded. Yet in holding scientific research and discovery in respect, as we should, we must also be alert to the equal and opposite danger that public policy could itself become the captive of a scientific, technological elite. So that was Eisenhower speaking in February 1961, <laughs> 50 years ago. And I think the reason why you haven't seen Dr. Judy's research featured anywhere is because of this scientific, technological elite which Eisenhower referred to 50 years ago. That's one of the main reasons. Now, as Dr. Judy has shown us, to acquire knowledge, one must study, but to acquire wisdom, one must observe. Okay? And that's what, that's what the first half was really doing. And I've also been doing my own form of observation, which is what I've built into this presentation. It's a different type of <coughs> observation, really. Observing people's behaviour more than anything else, and my interaction with them. Um, I'll do, I'm going to skip through this, I won't read all this out. We're going to look at some, um, my initial involvement with 9-11 Truth activities, how I came into contact with Dr. Judy Wood. I'll, I'll sort of try and summarise that. My background is basically in software engineering, which is a technical process, involves a lot of analysis, digesting a lot of information, finding an answer, solving a problem. That sort of mentality that I essentially have applied to this, or tried to, and ended up getting it wrong, which I'll show you about, in at least initially. Um, no large blowing crashes at the World Trade Center. Uh, and we've covered the evidence for directed energy weapon, uh, which is based on something called the Hudson Effect, or something like that, should, should I say. Um, and we're going to look at links between the energy cover up and 9 11 cover up. This again answers one of the questions of why you haven't heard about this. If you heard about thermite and all this nonsense, that's part of the reason because that, that is linked to the energy issue. But I'll try and cover it. We haven't got a lot of time. I'm going to race through this, so apologies for the breakneck pace, but I'm going to try and get through the important points that I'll have to get across to you. 
Uh, main thing here is that there's an active and ongoing effort to cover up and discredit research into Jew and no planes, and we're going to identify some of the individuals involved in that activity. And one of those individuals is Tony Gosley, who, when this presentation was posted on the forum, or at least the Derby one, it was moved from the event section into the controversial section of that forum by, I'm assuming, Tony Gosley. I've got some of the messages from him in this presentation. So he's one of the people involved in this cover-up, I'm afraid, folks. Um, I used to believe the official story, well, my Dr. Judy Wood uh, didn't believe it at all. I did. I believed it for about three years. And I started to doubt it in about, uh, uh, let's see, about August 2003, late 2003, something like that. And then I found about th things like state-sponsored terrorism and false flag terrorism, and I started to read stuff about that. And then I found out that even heavy-hitting investigative journalists like John Pilger and Greg Palast, they, wouldn't, they don't talk about 9-11. They won't even go into this stuff at all. They're supposed to be the heavy hitters. They don't touch this stuff. Mm -hmm. 